I mean, I have a podcast. I have a podcast, so you know, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so we're anyway, on the same. We're on the same world. Here. We're on the same world. So, so okay. So, um, you know, here I had the pleasure today uh, speaking with JJ French, guitar player, founder of Twisted Sister. Um, in fact, Twisted Sister was actually the first show that I've ever attended. I was eight or nine years old. Uh, it was at a club in New Jersey. But here's the thing: I read his book. Twisted Business, which I think is a fascinating read. I never knew really the backstory behind Twisted Sister, but after reading the book, and by the way, your book, I read, I read a lot, and your book was not boring. I mean, did, did you like plan for that? Or, I mean, how'd that come about? I didn't want to make a boring book. And if I was going to write a book and I was going to write it alone, it would have been 19 volumes. It would have been like the history of the Jews or something. So I brought a guy in uh, who's a close friend of mine and my mentor, who's a professional writer. And I said, let's um, let's make this interesting and compelling and quick and get the story out so that people will digest it. So everybody says the same thing. It's absolutely not what they expected at all. The lessons learned are universal, having nothing to do with the music industry and everything to do with the music industry. Um, uh, and that it's, it's a compelling read from beginning to end. And that's really what I wanted it to be. I want to be a compelling read. But I, I wanted people to understand that Twisted Sister's success was a byproduct of a lot of hard work and business moves and not sex, drugs, rock, roll, and fairy dust. Now, speaking about drugs i mean the book opened and and you're talking about that you're a hustler you're you're a dealer a new york dealer do you think that prepared you for the sleazy business of rock and roll yeah i mean i started out actually selling firecrackers and went from firecrackers to weed and then from weed to every drug on the planet for five years and then and then dealing drugs in Europe and in the Caribbean and smuggling drugs <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and uh, I was a byproduct of the 60s and, um, and all that that brought in, you know, it's hard to describe it. When you read, when I read the stories about these bands from LA, uh, you know, all the, the excessive sex, drugs and rock and roll of all these you know, LA bands, I, you know, whether it's Motley Crue or Van Halen, and, it, and while it's true, the Twisted Sister itself was a straight band. It, it was. But my era of drugs was, uh, was like um, a PhD versus the, what these guys talk about. I mean, New York City's drug scene was unbelievable. The dealing was unbelievable. The amounts were unbelievable. The risks were unbelievable. The potential for being murdered was on a daily basis. And uh, it was thrilling. And so uh, I got swept up into it because I was making a lot of money and I was buying guitars and amplifiers and all that. So if you're asking me with the skills honed as a dealer, the same skills that were used as a manager. Yeah, it's a people business. Okay. I'm not going to romanticize it and say, Hey, everybody, you should become a dealer. It's wonderful. I'm not going to say that because it's tragic as well. And it could have been a complete, disaster for me but i can't uh, separate my new yorkness and the hustle of new york from my background i can't remove it uh, it makes you kind of impenetrable and vulnerable if you you know if you make it here you can make it anywhere that's what frank sinatra says about new york and it's really true if new york doesn't throw you nothing throws you so i was up against street hustlers and the mob and everything else. And, and I negotiated my way through it. So it gave me a certain confidence that, that I could do it for sure. You know, Elon Musk recently said that you'll learn more dealing drugs than at college learning from a drug, uh, from a college professor. Musk said that? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm not going to argue his point. <laughs> I'm not going to argue his point. I mean, I survived it. I survived the multiple ODs. I survived the multiple almost murdered. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I guess so. I mean, if he actually said that, kudos to him. 
Uh, I will take a street person's knowledge over an academic any day of the week in business uh, because you learn how to deal with people in business. So I will say that for sure. And rock yeah. and roll, by the way, and rock and roll, let me be clear, is a criminal enterprise. The record labels are criminals. It's as simple as that. You know, they're just legal criminals. So um, when you're in the cesspool of criminality, whether it's obvious criminality, in other words, whether it's blue collar criminality where someone's threatening your life with a gun or it's white collar criminality, you're dealing with criminals. So you're dealing with the sleaze, the low lowlifes, the lying. I mean, you know, you don't believe any of this shit because, you know, you know they lie, everyone lies. So you kind of kind of have to get used to it. You, you know, you mentioned about, again, learning the tricks of the trade through drug dealing. And we talked about what Elon Musk said. But, you know, I did. I mean, I wanted to be a rock and roller, but I probably just did not, you know, take those risks. But um, I ended up going to college, you know, for years, you know, and I find when I was in the and, I, and I'm like the opposite of college. I mean, this was like pretty much an ultimatum. It's like, well, this is what you need to do, Dean. But I found like in college, there was a very elitist among professors, these academics, like they were smarter than everybody else. And if you weren't in their academic field, you were just dumb. And I think there was a lot of resentment among these academics that you could literally, like they saw people out in the real world just making millions of dollars, whether it's like, you know, starting an insurance company, um, you know, again, whether it's dealing dope, I mean, it didn't matter to them. It created a lot of resentment that these guys wearing gold chains were making more money like than they were. Well, what, you know, I'm hired by organizations to give motivational speaking, essentially to college graduates, people with degrees, multiple degrees, masters, PhDs. I'm giving them lectures. Why? Because I'm everything they wish they were. That's why. I succeeded in my dream. And by the way, you don't have to be a drug dealer to be a rock star. We're talking specifically managerial mentality and entrepreneurial mentality. It's a very different thing. I mean, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to recognize why you want to be an entrepreneur, and then you have to take it from there. But most entrepreneurs I know are seat of the pants guys who go out and take a lot of risks. You know, my brother's an academic. He would never take those risks. I describe it in my book, a discussion between my brother and myself, in which he describes how our lives are so very different. And the bottom line is I'm a risk taker. Entrepreneurs are risk takers. And you can't learn that in school. You really can't. You either have it in your gene pool or you don't. Is it something so, that you're born? Is, oh, okay, uh, you answered the question. I'm like, is it something that you're born with? I think so. I think so. I, I was always a big risk taker, and um, and and my life reflects that risk: enormous ups and enormous downs, and and adapting to all of them is the key to survival. So I say in the book, in the in, in the beginning, I was turned down more times in a bed sheet in a horror house, and I've come back more times in Freddy Krueger. You know, you don't get that out of a book. You get that out of an innate sense of survival. And it can almost kill people. I mean, it does kill people. It drives them to alcoholism. It drives them to drugs and all that. I already went through my drugs shit as a 15-year-old. I didn't care. So once I stopped at 20, going back was never a proposition, which meant that everything ever thrown at me, I was dealing strictly through business perspective and the prism of business and how to overcome this problem and that problem. And that's what I do in the book. The book turns roadblocks into pathways that I describe to people in great detail how we dealt with all the setbacks and how we pursued them. Oh, and, and look, there's every band has a story and every band probably has a different story, but I know our story is more compelling than 99%. So let me ask you this. I mean, right. It, it probably it is definitely more compelling. You know, rock has become a fringe market. I mean, Twisted Sister, I mean, you were like in the rock age, um, you know, probably the most famous band in the world. So like the rappers are the new kind of rock stars. I mean, do you, do you, what's, what's your perspective on like, why has rock become fringe? Why has like the rappers become like the big stars? Is it because well, they deal drugs? <laughs> no, I, I, you know, for all the people who go, man, what happened to rock? And it's being kept off for the radio. No one's playing it. It's because it's not happening. You know, the market doesn't 
create the stuff. The market follows trends. Hip hop is very, very trendy. Pop, female pop is very trendy. Country rock is very, very trendy. Rock music is not. And rock had a 50 year run. So I don't I'm not sitting here crying the blues over whether it's alive or dead. I mean, it's not dead. It's certainly not a current form of music that's particularly popular. And, and, that, and that's not me denigrating rock music. All you got to do is pick up Billboard magazine and look at it. And there's nothing right. there. There's one or two of rock albums. And the rest is hip hop. The rest is female pop. The rest is K-pop. The rest is country pop. There's a couple of rock acts here and there. You know, so like, uh, here's an example, you know. Uh, I'm 17 years old. I'm at the Fillmore East. I'm seeing Led Zeppelin. I'm seeing the Rolling Stones. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing Crosby, Stills and Nash, seeing The Who, seeing Jazz Joplin, seeing Jimi Hendrix, seeing Bob Dylan, right? You know how old all those people were when I was 17? They were 25. They were 25. Let me say that again. They were 25. Yeah. I was 17. So here's the, here's the question. Where's the 25-year-old rock stars? Where are they? The answer is there aren't any and uh, not any that have really broken through in a big way. So that says to you that the market is different. Are there 25 year old hip hop stars? Yes. Gosh. Are there 25 year old female pop stars? Yes. Are there 25 year old uh, K pop stars? Yes. Are there 25 year old country stars? Yes. Are there 25 year old 25 -year -old rock stars? No, they're not. So where's the, where's the farm team? coming from you know where is the farm team i don't necessarily sit there and go woe is me if that's if that's where civilization is at then fuck it that's where civilization is at i can't recreate it if i was a 20 year old kid wanting to get in the music business like i was at one time i'd look around me and go how do you make money in this fucking business like you know that's what i said to myself when i was 20 how do you make money and I followed the trends on how to make money in the business. Those trends are not the same as they are today. You know, when a 20 year old kid comes up to me and says, JJ, come and see my band. And I say, uh, you know, how old are you? You know, 20, 21, 22. And I ask them how long their band's been together. And they tell me two years. And I say, how many shows have you played in two years? And they go like a lot, man. And I go, what's a lot? They go like 50. And I go, oh, how long is your show? Like 40 minutes, 45 minutes? Yeah. I said, so you've done 50 shows in two years, right? 50, 45 minute shows in two years. That's what you're telling me, right? That's, that's great, right? Yeah. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, when you get to your 500 show, call me. I'll come and see your band. And they go, 500 shows? That'll never happen. I said, well, there's a good chance I won't fucking come and see your band because you're going to suck until you had about 500 shows of your belt. So let me illustrate something to you. From the first day Twisted Sisters started playing, which was in March of 73, to our first break, which was um, Labor Day weekend of 75. That was our first break. So we're talking about two years and five months, okay? In those two years and five months, we played on average six days a week, five shows a night, you want to know how many shows that was at the end of that 32 month stretch of time? 3,550 shows. You, you got me? By the time I was 22, by the time I was 22, I had, or 23 actually, I had, 75, I had played 3,500 performances with Twisted Sister. By the time D joined a couple months later and we got signed to Atlantic, add another 5,000 shows to that. We got signed after playing 8,000 shows. You saw us at the Fountain Casino. We were probably 7,500 shows in when you saw us. You tell me, what did you see when you saw the band that night? What do you remember? It, it, it was a great act. It was a great show, a tight band. Yeah, well, that's because we've done it thousands and thousands of times. Now, that does not exist today. That scenario does not exist. Right. I admit it. However, if I was a 20 year old kid, I would look around and say, what is happening today? And I would adapt my business plan to whatever that would be. And if that meant that rock and roll wasn't going to deliver it, maybe it's hip hop, maybe it's country pop, maybe it's something else. And if it is rock. I'd figure out another way to do it. But you got to figure out what you're doing at the time you're doing it. Let, let me ask you this, JJ. So here's the thing that because you you've you've experienced i would say the golden age of music you know there are always 
I just had this conversation with a buddy of mine the other night where in the music business, there was always a new vibrant technology or platform that connected consumers to artists. Like you had FM, FM radio. What was before FM? You had AM. So FM. Then you had Ed Sullivan. That that you know that put the Beatles on the map. It was a new platform that connected artists more on a global level. Then you had MTV. I've said, hey, if there was no MTV, maybe there would be no Twisted Sister. Maybe there would be no Michael Jackson. I mean, that's really where I probably heard of you first, or actually more of you, I should say, more of you on MTV. Um, and then, of course, you had the Idol shows, like American Idol, that did, you know, Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood. Again, a new, vibrant kind of a media. You know, and then in 2009, you had social media that kind of created this fractured kind of media. So let me ask you this. Do you think we have today a, an exciting, vibrant platform that connects consumer to music? I think TikTok is the number one platform in the world. It is. Knocked out Google this week. So there you go. I mean, TikTok, TikTok is the number one platform. The number one. Millions of kids are watching TikTok. You managed to, to, to capture that market, and you've caught the market for the time. So that's essentially what that is. So if I was in search of an outlet to show what I could do, I would concentrate on TikTok right now because people don't, you know, first of all, Facebook is for oldies fans, you know, like young people don't give a shit about that. Twitter is slowly dying. People are kind of sick of it. You know, like, what are you doing at four o'clock this afternoon? I mean, it kind of gets boring after a while. So TikTok is the thing right now. I mean, now, and the record labels, you know, the record labels don't A&R based on talent anymore. They base their A&R on, 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 on hits. That's really it on how, who's watching who. They don't give a shit. I mean, look, the same unfortunate evaluation of actors. You have two young people going for a part, and if they have a better social media than another person, they'll hire that person, even though the other person may be better, because everyone's scrambling for that dollar bill right now. So the scramble for the dollar bill, the scramble for the window of being recognized is, is, is where the fight goes. We happen to have two songs that are so famous worldwide that we are bulletproof. We're not going to take it and I want to rock. Are so big, so famous on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, used in more TV shows, more TV commercials, more movies. So I sit here embarrassingly successful because I sit here with two of the biggest, most licensed songs in the history of 80s rock. Um, just two weeks ago, the president of Ecuador was using We're Not Going to Take It as his theme song for running for president. The president of Spain, I had a video of 30,000 people in an arena singing We're Not Going to Take It. I'm not going to get into the legality of use. The point being is we're responsible for these songs. If right. Twisted Sister tomorrow wanted to do 100,000 people in Spain, we could play to 100,000 people in Spain. Okay? That's what that means. That's a luxury that Twisted Sister has. And if you look at the biggest bands that came out of 1973, Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, and Twisted Sister, those are three major names that came out of 73. There are other groups too, but thought, I'm gonna use those four as an example. Um, mega successful. God knows Kiss has sold more records than us. ACDC certainly sold more records than us. But if you ask a 10 year old kid, sing an ACDC song off the top of your head, the kid's not going to be singing it. If you ask them to sing a Kiss song, probably, maybe the parents will go, I want to rock and roll all night. Maybe the kid will know it. You know, uh, maybe, the, he won't know a priest song, that's for sure. But all you got to do is go, we're not going to take it, and you're off to the races. And the reason why you're off to the races is, do you know how many versions in TikTok of we're not going to take it there are? Thousands of them. Little kids, six-year-olds, four-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, they're all ages and they're all singing, we're not going to take it. And you know what I have to say to all of them? Merry Christmas and happy fucking Hanukkah. I love you all <laughs> because you help extend the brand. Well, well, you know, JJ, to validate your point, my wife is actually from India. She's been in America maybe like, um, maybe like 
over a decade. Um, you know, in India though, they had like Bollywood, those kind of music. And they had maybe like, she grew up with like the Backstreet Boys and Sync. But to validate your point, I like showed her the song and she's like, oh, I know that song. Yeah. There it is. But if yeah. I showed her a Kiss song and an ACDC song, she wouldn't know. She may not know. It. Right. And this is not to say that these bands are not incredible i don't love them please i don't want to get any oh no no you you just shit. no you you just wrote the uh, you just wrote i can't iconic songs that just touched on a gender and all demographics and i totally understand yeah that, that's all i mean so um and, and and we're grateful for that you know i thank d every day for that i mean he wrote those songs and they're phenomenal songs. So I'm very, very grateful that, that we have that kind of platform. Now, do you own now, 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 everyone's selling their publishing today. You know yeah, that. He sold his publishing several years ago. Okay. All right. So when people talk about their catalog, which is what you're talking about, yes. their publishing catalog, a lot of, you know, uh, the, the rank and file person on the street who reads a news story right. do not understand what, it, what the, the real story is. Let's take, for example, when a politician uses a song and a band goes, oh, do stop you, I'm going to sue you. Let's take that, for example. The average person who hears a song in the public domain, let's say you're at a sporting event and you hear we're not going to take it. If you're a friend of mine, you're sending me a text. Yo, man, just heard we're not going to take it at Yankee Stadium, ka -ching. I write back, yo, man, we don't get paid a penny. Sorry. What do you mean you don't get paid a penny? I said, let's, I said, that's the use of CSAC. That's the use of ASCAP. BMI, they pay the writer. They do not pay the artist. That's just the way the rules are. That's how the laws were written many years ago when the publishers had you know, a lot of lobbyists in Washington and could really make things happen. So that's one thing. So now a politician uses a song. Hey, man, I heard Trump use a song, right? So let's say Trump uses an Aerosmith song. Aerosmith hates Trump. We're going to sue you. The truth is they can't. The truth, the dirty little secret is they can't because Trump is probably using it in a venue that pays CSAC and ASCAP fees and have the legal right to use it without paying the artist, without asking the artist permission. When Trump uses a Queen song, we're going to sue you. Truth is they can't. The truth is legally they can use it. The only leverage an artist has against a politician who uses a song that they don't like is you make a public stink about it. You humiliate the politician. The politician doesn't want the bad press and the politician will stop using it, but there's no legal recourse. That's the biggest myth in the world. So the artist does not want to admit to the fan that they have no legal recourse because it sounds like you got no balls, right? It makes you know, sense. They and, don't and understand I, it. It does. And, and, and on, and being that you can, you have, you know, one of the most, you know, these 80s songs that, that are that are being licensed. I mean, so a lot of artists right now, though, um, I mean, what do you think of this in general? Who, who are like, I mean, selling off their catalog? I mean, I mean, it's their right. You have a you have a commodity. It's like having a painting and you sell it. I, you know, P Springsteen sold his catalog and. Dylan sold his catalog. Well, you know, you're getting paid for your catalog, whether you're selling it outright or not. So let's say you're making a catalog is always based on a, um, a multiple of certain percentage. So let's say the catalog is bringing in the writer. Let's just say that the catalog is bringing in $10 million a year to the writer's family. Uh -huh. Right now, let's take a multiple of 20 at 10 million. That's 200 million. Somebody comes around and says, I'll give you 200 million because I can recoup all that money within 20 years and the rest make profit. So the artist says to himself, do I want to sell it now and take a tax write-off, whatever I have to do and have the rest and have the cash because I have the cash in hand or do I want to risk the catalog going out there for the next 20, 30 years and going down in value? It's a gamble. Everything is a gamble. The people who buy these catalogs are gambling. The value is going to go up and the artist is gambling. The art value is going to go down. It's a business proposition. And I'm sure the artist will sit down with the lawyer and their business manager and say, what makes sense? Sure. So for, so for example, ZZ Top just sold their catalog for $40 million. You know, Dusty Hill is dead. These guys are in their late 70s. They're probably figuring, you know, um, 
you know, the, they want to take care of one or two more generations ahead of them. They want to have the cash. I mean, that's a very personal choice that an artist has. Now, the artist has more than that, too. You also have your your albums and who owns their own albums. Well, we all know Taylor Swift made a big deal out of the fact that I'm a slave to my record label. Well, the truth, Taylor, is we're all slaves to our record label. The right. Beatles are slaves. The Who are slaves. We're slaves. We're all slaves. They all own right. their masters. So what do we own besides the masters? Do we own our re-records that allow us to sell our versions for commercial purposes and keep 100% of the money? Yes, we do own our versions. Do we own a lot of other records? So we have five albums officially on Atlantic Records, and I've got about 10 albums that I've recorded that I own. Well, that's a value. Someday someone may go, I want to buy your catalog, your, you know, your records that you own, and maybe we will sell them someday. You know, uh, do you know what sound exchange is? Do you have any? Yeah, uh, yeah of course, it, you know what sound exchange sure. is, right? That that that's that's music that's played, uh, you streamed music. Right, right? streamed, right, see. Right, so now that's how the artist gets paid. The artist doesn't get paid on, on terrestrial radio. The artist gets paid for you know, stuff that's streamed. Mm -hmm. That's the turnaround. That's the flip around. You know, so the writer doesn't get paid for that. The copyright holder, mean the one who owns the album and the artist gets paid. Well, those catalogs are worth a lot too. People are selling those catalogs. It's a bet. It's a bet. It's a bet between someone who believes it's going to be worth more in the future versus your belief that it's not going to be worth more in the future. So you may as well take the money now and run. So again, it's a personal choice between the artist, their families, their management, their business manager, and, and where they want to take that, that bet. Sure. But since most of these artists are in their mid to late 70s, they're not going to be suffering financially in the future. You know, this, this, this takes care of money one or two or three generations down. It just goes to show, however, how valuable some of these song rights are. I mean, Dylan's song, if Dylan sold his catalog for what, 400 million or $500 million, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Or 400 million or 370, sure. whatever it is. That means that he's bringing in X amount of year times 20 years. It, it, listen, the Beatles sold off their catalog. Well, the Beatles, I'm sorry, had an opportunity to buy their catalog back in 1984 for $47 million. Now think about this. This is the Beatles. This is John and Paul. This is Yoko and Paul McCartney being offered their catalog in 1984 for $47 million and deciding it wasn't a good bet. Do you understand how crazy that looks right now? These are smart people with smart lawyers. They sat around. They said, how much is our catalog earning in 1984? Oh, about five million a year. Eh, I can do better with my money. So what did Paul do? Paul bought other songs like Happy Birthday and Somewhere Over the Rainbow and other shit. And, and Yoko, if I'm not mistaken, invested in Beefalo Futures in a farm upstate, like, because she thought that's where the money was going to be. Did they buy like Michael Jackson catalog? You know, Mike, no, Michael Jackson bought it. So Michael Jackson sitting with whatever, $220 million he made on Thriller with a lot of cash floating around. And his lawyers are going, you got a choice, either buy the Beatles catalog or give it to Uncle Sam. I'm using rough numbers i don't have the contracts in front of me i never saw the contracts i'm just giving you like a rough idea you're sitting around with 220 million bucks with nothing to do with it knowing that a whole lot is going to go to uncle sam and someone says oh you want to buy the beetle catalog 47 million bucks you go yeah sure now the beatles at the time didn't think it was worth it you and i could look at that and go how fucking stupid can these guys be how fucking stupid can they be? It's the Beatles, but they didn't care. So they sold to Michael Jackson. That catalog is worth a billion dollars now because of things that nobody could foresee. For example, nobody could foresee the anthology series. Nobody could foresee the ongoing interest in the Beatles. Here we are 51 years after they broke up and you have that Disney, you know, we just saw the, the incredible Beatle reunion movie. Here's a band that's never going anywhere. I mean, here's a band that the, the only subject in this world that's been written about more than the Beatles, I understand, is Jesus Christ. Seriously, in Western civilization, the only topic written about more than the Beatles is Jesus Christ. That, that, that's amazing. So you're almost, that, that, you know, what, what I like about EJJ is that, like, you have a lot of knowledge. And no, that is actually true. Um, yeah, Christianity actually has more books written about that religion, whether it's criticism, theology, than, than anything in the world. And then two is the Beatles. And two of the Beatles. 
So, I mean, I'm sorry. You know, Lenin, right. Lenin, okay, he wasn't more popular than Christ. Almost. <laughs> you oh, know oh, I mean? so he was wrong when he said he's more popular than Jesus then. Yes. He was wrong. He, and he actually, what he said was, his quote was, there are many people who believe we are more, more popular. Oh, okay. <laughs> to be fair to him. He didn't say we are. He said to many people, we are more. So the point is, they're damn popular. Yeah. And, and they're everywhere. And, you know, Neil Aspinall, the manager who took over after Brian Epstein died, was, was asked about the music business. And he goes, I'm not in the music business. I'm in the Beatle business. Beatle business is not the music business. Beatle business is a whole nother thing. You know, there really is the Beatles and everybody else. It really is. It's the Beatles and, and everybody else. So I only bring that up to illustrate the fact that as smart as they were, they didn't see their catalog as being of any value, which uh, of that value, which is mind blowing. You know, and let me just take one little detour uh, because honestly, this is a personal question that I want to know that because it seems like you have like, again, a lot of hustle, you don't give up, you keep on going. But, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, Twitch's sister, uh, lived like kind of that, that classic rock and roll lifestyle and um, kind of that behind the music story where, you know, you worked hard, you played in clubs, um, you know, you, you rose to fame and then, and as quick as you kind of ascended to the top, it was a kind of a steep decline. And um, you mentioned it because you released um, a single that, that confused the perception of the band. You went more from a, a heavy band and people looked at you as a soft band because when you released that video, um, MTV was playing funny videos like, you know, Devo and like artists like Flock of Seagulls. But here is the thing. It seemed like after that moment, you were like kind of folded the cards. I mean, because to me, okay, um, you... Um, you released one maybe single that kind of confused people. Why didn't you go back at it at a second time? Um, there was too much animosity within the band at that time. Okay. And so the band didn't, couldn't sustain itself and walked away. Now, the band's timing was impeccable because we walked away before the hair metal thing fell apart because of the arrival of Nirvana right. and Alice in Chains. Which basically wiped out the like the it's like the the it's like the asteroid that killed the dinosaur you know came in and wiped everything out in about a day by the way in about one day the whole genre was wiped out we were already gone and so when we came back in two thousand and one as a fully formed um uh oh god what's the word for it we we were we were like mummified perfectly mummified. And we decided to return under very certain special circumstances. One, we repaired our personal problems because we're smart. And there was no way to predict where this was going, except that we did make a, a smart business move, which is we're not coming back to play corner bars. We're not coming back to be lumped in with three hair metal bands in some 2000 seat room. Either we're coming back as superstars or we're not coming back. And we came back as top line festival headliners. So we returned and spent 14 years headlining 150 of the world's biggest rock festivals, playing to an average of 40 to 100,000 people a night. Now, here's the thing. How many bands can play to 100,000 people? How many bands are trusted to play to 100,000 people. How many bands are trusted by promoters to headline festivals with 100,000 people? And the answer is a little tiny group. Because if you suck, you take the festival down with you. You take the promoter down, you take the festival down, you take yourself down. So you better be damn great. And Twisted Sisters damn great because we worked really hard to be great. And so that never let us down. Um, I'm really proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that our business model upon the return was so clear and lived up to itself 100%. You know, I have to say, um, the innate um, survival technique in my brain stems from something I was taught many, many, many years ago about how to judge people. 
And someone said to me, there's three kinds of people on this earth. There's the people who make it happen, the people who watch it happen, and the people who go, what the fuck just happened? 99% of the people go, what the fuck just happened? A sliver watch it happen, and the minutest tip make it happen. And I swore to myself, I was either going to make it happen or watch it happen, but I was never going to say what happened, ever. I was going to read as much as I could and stay on top of it. I was never going to be shocked by something. I was going to know. And I talk about it in my book. I talk about the difference between proactive and reactive chaos in a company and how a company has to respond to proactive and reactive trauma. You know, reactive trauma is, for lack of a better description, like um, uh, a tr one of your trucks kills somebody. And all of a sudden, your company's th thrown for a loop because someone died and there's lawsuits and all that shit, you know, and you have to figure out what you're doing. But proactive trauma is, you know that you, you have to change your company drastically. You have to lay off 50 people, you have to do something in order to survive. You know this in advance. So you're able to prepare yourself for the move that, that takes place. And it's always better to be proactive than, than reactive. And if you have to be reactive, if you have to survive against really bad news, I give you tools on how to digest it. Because every time we were turned down, we followed a process, which is in the book, on how to recover from it and how to continue on. And the successful businesses always do. Otherwise, you pack up and go home. So when Twisted ended that first time, that's because every option that I looked at, every pathway was shut. And so I took the nuclear option, which was I blew up the company and walked away because that's what was necessary for my survival at that time. But you know what I realized too, and just you know, watching artists is that, and, and it happened with your band, you've worked so hard and playing clubs and all that time for that one moment that you achieved. It was like the worldwide fame. You had it all. And why is it when people or band or anything reaches that moment, although it's the mountaintop experience, it's also the toughest where people can immediately fall off the mountain but we didn't understand our pinnacle, our mountain climb really was on the tube show in England, 1983. Being signed to Atlantic was really the, the top of the mountain because it really was the, at least in my head, that was the point where the recognition, that was the confluence of, of preparedness met opportunity, which really that's not, there's no such thing as luck. It's preparedness meeting opportunity. Okay, so preparedness met opportunity at that moment on the tube show, which is on YouTube. So if you go Twisted Sister, the tube show, you will see the show that got us signed. The reason why we got signed was because of the techniques we use on that show were performance techniques that we knew worked. And it altered the atmosphere in the studio to the point where it went from nothing to mayhem. And it led to the band gang sign. So if I look at that point and say, that's when I said, okay, we've made it, we've, we've staked our claim. Then we had a really good five year run. So it wasn't just like this. Now, Stay Hungry did go up here, but again, it didn't happen in a day. You know, there was a sustained plateau. The question is when we hit that speed bump, we were just gonna take the speed bump and move. And there was a lot of damage done. I'll be the first to admit it. And I describe it in the book. Okay. But it wasn't the end of my life. You know, if I was 22 years old, I probably would have wanted to kill myself. But I was already 35, 36. I was already smart enough to know what my limitations were and what my strengths were and how the business was moving. So I never got particularly phased by it. You know, I describe in the book the time in my life that I wanted to commit suicide, which is when I was 22 and the original band broke up. And my mom died. My girlfriend left me in the same week. And that crushed me. That crushed me emotionally. And I wanted to commit suicide. And I, and I wrote in the book how I dealt with that. After that, every trauma that ever hit me, I was bulletproof after that, which meant, okay, it sucks, but I'll figure it out. Okay, it sucks, but I'll figure it out. 
okay, it sucks, but I'll figure it out. So at the time that the band ended in 88, it sucked. Okay, it sucked. I went through a divorce, simultaneously went through a divorce. And, um, and I got a straight job working at a pool hall. So, uh, you know, someone said, well, how'd you deal with this? Well, what, what else are we going to do? I'll figure it out. You know, like something's going to happen. And something did. Ultimately, I found Seven Dust and produced Seven Dust. And Seven Dust was so successful that um, I made more money with Seven Dust than I ever made with Twisted as a manager and producer. So I, I was like, wow. You know, I came back a second time. Statistically, you don't come back a second time. So before Twisted even came back, I came back more successful with Seven Dust. I mean, Seven Dust debut album to this day is their biggest selling record. It's almost platinum. I've produced one album in my life in Mark Mendoza, and it's platinum. I don't want to fuck with my record. You know what I mean? I've, I've almost platinum album on my, you know, I don't want to mess with it. Our two songs, Bitch and Black, from that album were the number one and number two alternate metal songs of college radio that year. So what that said to me was I really had it. And Seven Dust is a great band. You know, Seven Dust, their journey was almost like Twisted. If you ever knew, if, I didn't write the entire story of Seven Dust, but Seven Dust was the end of a seven-year run that started with a band called Red Threat in 1988 and morphed from Red Threat to a band called Roulette to a band called Cupid's Arrow to a band called Snake Nation to a band called Steph Kitty to a band called Crawl Space to a band that eventually became Seven Dust. Over seven years of personnel changes song changes style changes and we stuck together and moved and moved and moved and then seven dust finally had its moment in the sun so if i look at that on top of the twisted sister experience on top of the reunion of twisted sisters experience on the top that i had two heart operations that i survived one almost killed me on the top where i had prostate cancer and had an operation and i could have died from that what I need you to understand, Dean, is there's an entire body of life experiences there that the totality speaks to the survival technique and the ability to come back over and over again. And my daughter has an eye disease that's a leading cause of blindness among girls in America. And I raise money for that hospital. So, you know, the thing is, you just can't stop. You just have to keep pushing on. Yeah, this is a, you know, again, this was a great discussion. Um, it, it was a, again, just the fact that, um, you know, you're different than the typical rock and roller, right? And well, I think- We did it like, straight though. Do you understand? We were not confused with drugs and alcohol. That is a very, very big thing that you need to take away from this thing. You know, we may have experienced certain things that were standardized in the music business, but the other part that we were not was a partying bunch of idiots who were taken advantage of. You know, we dealt with our shit. And let me just say this, too, and be really clear about it. There is no way Twisted Sister would have been successful had not Mark Mendoza, Eddie Ojeda, and Dee Snyder been as great as they are. With all the shit that we went through and all the personality problems, those guys answered the bell every fucking night for thousands and thousands of performances. And they sacrificed their personal lives for this dream that we all shared. You know, I stand side by side with D for better or for worse, greatest front man I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen them all. There's no better front man in this business. None, none. I mean, I've watched them all. He out sings them, he out performs them. He out master of ceremonies them. He takes a hundred thousand people in his hand like it's nothing, like it's nothing. And Eddie Ojeda's guitar playing is dead on perfect every night. And Mendoza's bass playing is amazing. And, and AJ Perot, you know, when we lost AJ, it was, it was horrible. That hurt me more than all, just about anything, okay? Because it was the dedication of these guys, this nonstop dedication. So um, I don't know what other bands say about other band members. I don't know. I, I can't give you chapter and verse on what Motley Crue says about themselves and what Judas Priest says about themselves or what Poison says about, I, I don't know what they say. I can tell you that I have no problem giving all the credit out to these guys. And a quote from Ahmed Erdogan, the chairman of Atlantic Records said to me, when I asked him how Atlantic Records was so successful as a label, how he went from signing John Coltrane back in the early fifties, all the way through Led Zeppelin, Crosby, Stills and Nash, to ACDC, to Twisted Sister, to now all the current hip hop and pop artists. He said to me, 
success is easier if you don't mind who gets the credit. That's a tough rule to live by, but it is a rule that I live by. Yeah, I think I was actually watching an interview, uh, you know, mentioned uh, Doc McGee, you're familiar with that manager. And um, he mentioned that, that, you know, where he said, where he said to him, he just always would bump into smart people. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> so here's another thing before we wrap it up. You basically said you just gave a shout out to all your band members, how they all showed up. You had a front man that was one of the best lead singers in the world, performers. But ultimately, what broke Twisted Sister, and this is in your book, is nothing to lose. The desire of I'm going to make it happen. Now, I can't believe it happened. Do you find today, and we're in a generation that does not have that nothing to lose attitude. That's a generalization, though, that you make. I could say that I could say this to you when Twisted Sister was the littlest band in the littlest club on Long Island in 1973, where our name was this big, there was 500 artists that were bigger than us in 1973. None of them made it. We did. Does that mean that they didn't have a desire to make it? No, it just meant that a combination of reasons why it didn't, it didn't. But somebody always wins. So to generalize as a generation and go kids today you know I, I i find it's a hard thing to say you know why because there are winners today you know there are winners so we right, know. Right. And, and by the way and i by the way and i completely agree with you like I, i'm not that person that looks that thinks oh you know if it was today i'm just saying in the music front okay i just found out that where you had the, the earlier artists were the foundation of music. It was the, they created the pillars. So the artists today are living off those fumes. Okay. Uh, and, and what I'm saying is that, you know, where you're hustling the streets, someone's in like their bedroom with like, you know, $50,000 worth of equipment calling themselves an indie pop bedroom artist. I mean, and if, what do they have to lose? I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll think about that when they go to Starbucks. No, I, I don't want to. Yeah, I do. Listen, <laughs> I, I understand exactly what you're saying. So when I'm watching The Voice or American Idol and the winner wins that $100,000 record deal yeah. and they, they say, you're the winner, you're the new voice. And that singer, some 22-year-old guy, girl, whatever, they, them, says this. I want to thank my fans for sticking with me for 15 weeks. Yeah, you know, do I want to fall off my chair in hysterics? Do I want to just roll my eyes and go, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. So my response to that is, okay, you just won the lottery. And are you going to piss that motherfucker away? I don't begrudge people winning the lottery. I don't. And if they're truly talented, maybe they will flip it like Kelly Clarkson. She has a career, okay? Carrie Underwood, she has a career. Can you name anybody else in The Voice, anybody else from any of those shows that have a career? I mean, okay, Jennifer Hudson, fair enough. Uh, you know, didn't win, but has a career. And, and um, uh, there, there, there's a handful, okay? A handful. But would it be statistically the same as anything else in terms of the success failure ratio? Probably. Because the entertainment business is a brutal fucking business. It's a pyramid scheme. You know that. Of course. There's only a little room at the top for anybody. You know, when Twisted's album, Stay Hungry, broke, I said to my record label, I said, you know, it's time. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I feel like I'm on a jetway. And like, we're the next heavy metal band to take off, you know, because all the stars were aligned on that record, you know, so Motley Crue took off, you know, Quiet Riot took off, then Motley Crue took off, then Rat took off. And I said, I think we're going to take off. And we did. And then after we took off, there were, you know, tons of hair bands that, you know, Poison and this one and that one all took off. 
Um, right place, right time. But if you look at the history of hair bands on the strip, there's thousands of them that didn't succeed. Right. Thousands of them. Go down to the go down to the village in the 60s when Dylan was signed. Everybody was a singer songwriter. Hundreds of guys drove in with guitars and tried to do it and didn't succeed. Go to Nashville today. Everybody in Nashville is a stone cold motherfucking musician. You can't suck in Nashville. You're not allowed to suck in Nashville. If you suck in Nashville, I think they put you on a plane. They send you back to where you came from. I think that you're not allowed to suck in Nashville. I was in Roberts. I don't know if you go to Nashville much. Roberts is, I do. is, is a great bar on, on Broadway, right? You go to Roberts on any given day and you see these fucking ridiculous players, 25 year old kids like playing rings around Brad Paisley, you know, and I'm in there. I'm in there one day with my wife. We're having, you know, a bologna sandwich and, you know, and a Coca-Cola or something. And, and there's this band playing. And I walk up to the guitar player when it's over. And I said, I just want you to know, even though nobody here is paying attention, I am. You're a motherfucker. You're amazing. And he says to me, that's the problem. Everybody down here is a motherfucker and amazing so hats off to all those who continue to follow their dream you know you have to be at the right place at the right time and you have to be prepared to step up when the right time is there i just don't i don't begrudge anyone's success and i don't and i just wish for the people who have success to understand the rules of success which are this the public rents you fame it doesn't sell you fame you do not own fame you rent it for a short period of time. There are so few artists who own fame. There's your McCartney, Madonna, you know, Springsteen, Michael Jackson, the Eagle. Okay, they own it. But for the most part, 99% of all people who make it big rent it. And rent's and due every month. And the rent's due every month. And, and, and your mistake and the mistake they make is they think it's owned. So they spend their money stupidly and they blow it instead of sitting back. I never, ever, ever thought that rent was owned. I always thought it was rented. I was always grateful for it. And I never altered my living style. So when things went through its ups and downs, my lifestyle never changed. Ever. So where can, you know, I mean, you've reinvented yourself into a, a public speaker. As you said, you know, you, you speak in colleges and corporations. So, you know, where, where do people find out about you and how to book you? Well, they can book me by going to ask, ask JJTS at gmail.com, which is ask J J Y J U A T S, and, and they can inquire there. But as everybody knows, all the businesses are closed. No one's doing anything. You know, you're doing yeah. online viral stuff, but no one's doing, you know, I do some in-person but it's rare right now. But what I suggest is get the book, Twisted Business, available on Amazon. Um, read that, understand that. And if you want to book it, you know, then contact me at askjjts at gmail.com. And also my podcast, which is The French Connection on Apple, Spotify, and, and Podcast One. I have new guests every week and I'm having a great time with my podcast. And by the way, Twisted Sister Records, we have a new double vinyl album coming out. It's a greatest hits record live in, in the studio. Um, we always have new product in the marketplace. That's easy to find. You just put Twisted Sister product and you'll find it everywhere. So easy enough. Well, again, JJ, again, thanks for coming on. It was a, a great conversation. Um, I'm completely motivated by you hearing you talk. And um, I actually don't say that a lot. Um, I'm usually the one that has to motivate others. And um, it's really good when you can kind of sit at the pew and someone's up there and they can motivate. We, we all need to be poured into sometimes. And I think that's the, the leaders is we're like spend our lives pouring out. Sometimes we need to sit and be poured into. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it, Dean. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, um, good luck and um, we'll be in touch.